believe it or not, elephant carcasses aren't that hard to hide. It's the only way we can tell is, is through collar. In the fossil record, all Asian elephants had tusks. I know of collared elephants in highly disturbed areas that have kept moving, 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 moving. An area of over 5,000 square kilometers, which is extremely abnormal for the Asian elephants. How do you then bridge the gap here between behavior and conservation? The elephants are evolved to be the biggest, strongest thing on the landscape. There's really not been anything that's been able to affect them until we came up with weapons tracking data has been really eye-opening about how their societies work and it's been the key data source for motivating government to action. They're incredibly resilient animals obviously. They make the best of, a, of the bad situation. Although there is still some light at the end of the tunnel for the species to reach the end of the tunnel, there is a long way ahead and it's only through Welcome to another round of uh, CWS Wildlife Chronicles. And this is a webinar series we have been running. Uh, we used to do these uh, in person uh, at our Bangalore office prior to the pandemic. And then once the pandemic hit us, we had to switch to this webinar mode, which has been well received. So we have been continuing this uh, session and we've covered a range of uh, topics. We are uh, a non-governmental organization doing wildlife research and conservation, focusing on, on, uh, on a range of conservation areas and, and species uh, ecological research and, and so on. I am Dr. Sita Vijayakrishnan. I'm a principal scientist at CWS and I've been uh, heading the elephant program since last year. We are celebrating the, the 10th anniversary of, you know, the initiation of the World Elephant Day celebrations. It started in the two, year 2012. For a lot of us, and, and, and I'm sure George would agree with me on this, for a lot of us, every day is Elephant Day because anything uh, unrelated to elephants is just irrelevant to us. And we literally think about elephants almost every day but again it is also important to have these days to celebrate the species to reach you know get the message across to the greater commons and perhaps also through sessions like these highlight the importance of ecological research and conservation of these magnificent animals and when we were planning the webinar for this year i wanted to have a session on understanding the importance of behavior or behavioral research in in conservation and when I actually conceived this idea, the first person I thought of was uh, Dr. Wittemeyer. Dr. George Wittemeyer is an associate professor at the, the Colorado State University. And uh, he's also the, uh, the chair of the scientific board for Save the Elephants, which is a, a trust base in Africa, which has been doing exemplary work on uh, African elephants for over five decades. So we're going to have a conversation here talking about uh, some of the work that uh, Dr. Wittemeyer has done in the past. I'll try and step in once in a while, draw parallels with research that has happened on Asian elephants and perhaps also give some context uh, here. So welcome to this wonderful session, George, and, and thanks for readily accepting our invitation to uh, be here on this wonderful location. I'm just going to quickly get into the session. Before that, uh, would you mind uh, telling us in a, you know, quickly about the work that you have been doing in, in uh, Buffalo Springs and other areas? Yeah, so nice to see everybody. Thanks for the invitation. So I've been working in uh, an African elephant population for uh, 25 years. So over half of my life has been on one population. And um, <clears throat> there's programs focused on individual elephants. And so uh, we you know each individual that comes into the protected area. We've identified them with characteristic uh, patterns in their ears, uh, body scars, sometimes pigmentation things on their skin. There's a family that has uh, sort of pink legs. They have sort of this, you know, skin condition that really identifies them. So things like that. It make, actually, elephants are pretty easy to identify um, if you spend some time with them. And so we're monitoring around 1,000, 1,200 elephants that, that regularly use the park. Um, it's part of a broader population of, of African elephants that's about uh, seven to 8,000 individuals. And, um, and it's a really extraordinary place because the elephants are incredibly habituated to humans. And that's due to a long-term stable tourist presence. And so as long as you're in a vehicle, the elephants pretty much ignore you and carry on in their daily life. And that's allowed us to sit quite close to them um, we have wonderful access to watching individual interaction, you know, different types of behavior, uh, mother calf interactions, those kind of things. We can collect a lot of our sampling is non-invasive, so we're reliant on dung samples. Um, and so being that close, we can easily collect dung samples from known individuals, which gives us quite a bit of resolution on what's going on with them. Um, 
And it's, it, but it's also an open ecosystem and it's got a lot of challenges. It's actually the, the protected area uh, represents about, you know, one to 2% of the entire area that elephants use. And so the elephants are highly reliant on community lands, land or private lands, lands owned by other people. And some of those people are happy to have elephants on their land and some aren't. And so there can be uh, quite a bit of challenges with that. And, and it's also an incredible wilderness area. So there's not uh, great uh, road access. It's very rough terrain um, and it's very remote. And so um, it makes it a bit hard to get out to places you know, the protected areas are easily accessible, but other areas where the elephants use aren't. Um, and it's in northern Kenya. And so we're surrounded uh, by Somalia to the east, Ethiopia to the north, South Sudan to the northwest, and northern Uganda to the west. And, and those countries um, have been through quite a bit of uh insecurity and and problems somalia really doesn't have a functioning government and that that means that there's quite a bit of uh illegal weapons that are around flowing through the area and through the time we've been out there we've increasingly had uh, a number of problems with the amount of weaponry in the system so we have uh pretty much everybody is now armed with uh small arm automatic weapons, primarily AK-47s and M16s. M16s are American made and they were um, used to arm the Ethiopian military to deal with problems in Somalia by the US military. And then those weapons came into our system. Um, the AK-47s are primarily Chinese made and they're flooded uh, the, kind of the whole world really, the AK those AK-47s are everywhere. So, um, that uh, gives a lot of problems to not only the elephants, but also the people and it's, you know, security is a bit of an issue. And so we've been around, uh, had to deal with or, or use our research to understand a lot of these problems. Um, a big part of the work we did that's um, actually on a bit of a hiatus right now has been on illegal killing for ivory. We had a major pulse of ivory poaching that started around 2009. Um, it, we were able basically through the with the with the goodwill of the Chinese government by banning the domestic ivory trade it pretty much under undermined the valuation of ivory in our system and and so the ivory poaching ended by about 2015 or or greatly reduced by then but we'd already lost probably a third of the population by that time so um, it happens it came in it was a pretty big surprise to us because we didn't have that issue and it hit the population very hard. Um, and so, you know, we, we also do one thing that uh, isn't very common or as common in, in India, although in some other Asian elephant populations in other countries they do, we do a lot of GPS radio tracking on elephants. Yeah. So we're in a very vast ecosystems, uh, 30 to 40,000 square miles. Uh, you know, it's, it's a huge, uh, area that they use and there is a lot of risk involved as I mentioned so we use radio collars to uh, monitor individuals that are at risk they say big tuskers uh, maybe we put a collar on just to keep see if we can keep monitoring them and try to keep them safe um, but yeah. we're also doing an enormous amount of, of planning on the landscape and so identifying important areas uh, elephants use that are in community areas and flagging those as you know, potentially high high potential tourism areas or um, areas that uh, might be of, of conservation value in other ways for the for the community, and then also really working on connectivity in the system. They're trying to identify so, those key paths and corridors. So, if if I may just interrupt there, you know, a moment. I guess this was a question that I you know I wanted to ask later, but now that you've set the ball rolling in in that context, you know, this is a question that you know we kept. Uh, getting asked about as well, uh, and uh, the the African elephants, not so much the Asian elephants, particularly in, in India, where most most of our parks are fairly well protected. The African elephants are targeted immensely for their their uh, tusks or getting culled as uh, part of population control measures. And very often, many of these measures uh, are regardless of their sociality. And and you have already 
uh, you know, spelled out the importance of individual idiosyncrasies and the importance of them being extremely complex social animals. And uh, if I am to draw parallels with the Asian elephant, this is very similar to the exercises where individual elephants are removed for conflict mitigation. Now, uh, if I may ask you, well, you know, if you could just briefly tell us about uh, what you, what have been some of your key findings in terms of the consequences of, you know, removing individuals, be it for poaching, be it for population control, for translocation, culling, uh, or or even poaching, and and what has how has that really affected uh, the the sociality of these animals and their behavioral profiles? Um, yeah, so so we've done quite a bit of work on that uh, because we've had so much pressure on the population. Um, we've we've done mostly work on that in terms of the females. So the females have the most uh, complex and intricate relationships, really among probably they're one of the top species in the animal kingdom in terms of the social complexity and the, and the degree of bondedness they have. Um, and we've done quite a bit of work looking at what happens when you remove individuals from the population. Uh, at sort of the macro scale, we've looked at how that changes the social network. So sort of the broader population level connectivity between individuals. And we found that when you but, you know, at the ivory poaching, they come in and they tend to remove the largest individuals. So in, in our setting, uh, the large males were killed first, um, and then eventually they sh you shoot out all the males. So there's sort of only males in the, you know, 18 to 20 or you know, early 20s kind of thing are the biggest males left. And then those are getting to be similar to large females. So the pressure switched and started killing large females. Um, and that really disrupted the the, the family groups. And what we found was when you remove these large females, the, the, the younger daughters um, would sort of fill in their social role. So they, so the macro scale social network actually stayed pretty similar um, to what it was before the poaching. And so we took that as a good sign, like the, the, the social network was pretty robust. You know, we, we look at this in terms of people are doing this now in terms of our our uh, electricity networks or something. If, if there's a terrorist attack and takes out part of this, the electricity network, how robust will it be? Um, and so it was sort of similar. We did a similar analysis to those kind of things and found that um, the network was pretty robust. But um, as we got more into the behavior, what we found was these, these uh, orphaned individuals. So these sort of disrupted families, um, particularly uh, groups where there was no adult left, um, they had really different uh, impacts on what they might do. So some of them would stay with an aunt or join their cousin and um, and they would, you know, cut a related family and sort of stay with them, um, which we thought seemed like kind of a, the, the best case scenario. Um, we looked at this initially, we were calling this adoption, but it, it's not at all adoption. Um, the adults actually don't interact with these calves much at all, these, these juveniles much at all. It's much more they're hanging out with their age mates um, and other and younger bulls that are a part of the group. And so they're, they're losing that contact with adults. Um, and they're also subject to a lot more um, agonistic interaction. So a lot more aggression is, is aimed at them. And so we found, we actually just had a paper come out this week that shows yeah. you know, some of the ramifications of this. So we know they have, they tend to have lower survival than yeah. non-orphan, than, than a normal social setting. Um, they, t it looks like they have uh, their adrenal cort, their sort of stress responses are dampened such that they don't really have much stress response to things, which, um, is not a good sign. It's kind of an indication. In humans, we talk about that as an indication of uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome. Um, yeah. And so there's something physiologically going on. And then we just released a paper this week that talks about how they're actually stunted. Yeah. Their growth is stunted. Yeah. And so they're shorter than, than not, you know, elephants raised in normal settings. And so there's pretty major ramifications for them physiologically. Um, they're incredibly resilient animals, obviously. And so yeah. they, you know, they make best of, a, of the bad situation, but um, it's not, yeah, it's not like a great thing for them. And then we've tried to look a bit at the males. The males are a bit 
harder um, to study because they move a lot more in our system. Um, but when we've had so much disruption in the males that it's it, there's not much left of the original social structure. What, what we found with the males is that they, you know, they too have, they're very highly social. We tend to think of males as solitary, but they're also highly social. Um, it's just that they, they have periods in the year when they're not social and that's when they're reproductively active and they're, they're highly competitive with other males. And so when they're, when they're sexually active and highly competitive, they're not very social because the social interactions are competitive. And so um, that sort of inundates, but when they're not, when they're out of must, um, they are really social, they have really long-term bonds and they're always with the same individuals. And so, um, you know, in our, in our context, we can see that social networks quite strong. Mm -hmm. And what we've had happen is basically the most of the, you know, all the, almost all the adult individuals have been removed. And so we haven't, uh, had success and there's, there's not much to, there's no, there's, there's the before and the after doesn't exist because the individuals, um, were all removed. So we haven't been able to assess how do they respond to this, but we know all this removal of individual males, which, you know, is happening through um, human elephant conflict interactions. I, you know, a lot of it targeted at males. Um, that's going to have ramifications on the males too. We just don't know what those are. Which brings me to my next question. So, uh, you know, uh, you have some of these mature adult bulls uh, getting removed as a result of poaching, sometimes because of conflict where they're getting speared or they get poisoned or electrocuted. And, and uh, uh, there's this trend that has been explained in the past in, in carnivores, for instance, where if you just remove uh, a large carnivore from a particular area, you have other younger individuals coming and colonizing uh, those, those territories. And is that something that you have observed here as well, where if you have these older, mature adult bulls you know, losing, out from the, losing from the population, uh, have you observed some sort of colonization and what behavioral changes tend to happen there? Uh, one, and then the second question is, uh, in the absence of the older males, then of course the younger males also don't have, you know, in the, the older bulls to in some sense associate with and learn from. So are these phenomena that you have observed and then uh, what are your observations on those? Yeah, we, I mean, we have some colonization, but the poaching was pretty widespread. So mm -hmm. the, the, you know, the, the big males in the system were removed. It wasn't just locally. So the colonization, what happened in our system is basically when, when we started in that ecosystem, the big males were in their, you know, mid thirties, late in their early forties. Yeah, you know, maybe some some there's some fast growers, maybe around 30 or so. They were big and dominant, and um, as they all got removed, um, we started having sort of the big males be in their 20s, and they're you know a mid 20 male now in our system's a big guy in our mind, even though he's relatively not. And so it's sort of the age structure shifts lower to who's the dominance, and they. They fill that role, but it's different. It's a bit different than the the, the real mature males in the way they um, you must, in the way they sort of uh, move around. And so we don't have before we had pretty predictable patterns of which males would be in dominating the reproduction during what time of year, and we have much less of that now. It's much more mixed up. Um, so the, the population, the demography, you know, the population still is reproducing and doing fine, um, but it's it's different the way it's happening and, and the ramifications of that we don't know. Um, one thing that that might be happening is that the females, the, the guarding of females is sort of less effective with these younger guys. And so females might be getting, you know, sort of chased around a bit more than they did before and, and this kind of thing. And, um, and so that's one of the things that happens if you don't have any really big dominant males and you have an estrous female, then um, it's not, you know, they're not able to monopolize and, and she gets harassed a bit more. So things like that. But they're, you know, they, you know, basically as you shoot out the older individuals, the younger males fill in that opportunity, right? They, they normally are sneaking around trying to sneak into opportunities, but 
if there's no competition, they don't need to sneak as much. They can just uh, That's true. take over that role. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, and and uh, to what extent in that po population that you are studying, are you also observing a trend which I did come across very recently and some of our participants also may have stumbled upon it in the media about how you have greater proportion of trustless females of late. Uh, you know, uh, one of the reasons being uh, poaching. So, uh, how has that trend been in the population that you are studying? Yeah, so we've, um, interestingly, this is our... This is our second recorded um, poaching epidemic. So this last one, as I mentioned, removed about a third of the elephants. Um, mm -hmm. That selection pressure isn't enough to really change the, the ratio of tusklessness. But, and it happened pretty quick, right? So it was sort of seven, eight years of poaching. So the genes, the, the, you know, the genetic lineages weren't um, actually impacted for long enough you know given the generation time of elephants 25 years and the poaching pressure was sort of you know relatively short relative to that um and it wasn't um 100 and so it, it won't have a huge impact on on tusklessness um in the past we've had um we've had some more thorough um episodes but we weren't on top of the demography so in the 70s our system probably lost two thirds of the elephants in it. But again, that might not be enough to, to really impose these impacts. The places where we've seen the mass of tusklessness increase um, have been places where 95% of the elephants were, were removed from the system. So you, you take out basically almost all of the elephants and you're left with, you know, probably over half the remainders are tuskless. Um, that, that really shifts things pretty quickly. And, and then, you know, the, the obvious example we have, um, so, so the African scenario that, where that work was um, in, in, uh, in the Gorongosa Park is, is a place that had that type of severe poaching. And there's, multi, there's several other places that had that severe poaching. And then, you know, the Asian elephant story is similar. Like in, yeah. in, in the fossil record, all Asian elephants had tusks. Um, so it's yeah. only in contemporary time that we have, um, you know, that, ele that Asians lost their tusks and that, um, you know, and it, it's relatively certain that was due to human pressure on Asian elephants. Right. So, so okay. the Asian elephant is, is the more, is the more um, spectacular example of what we can do in terms of selecting for ivory. Totally. And, and I think, uh, in fact, we are, we're also seeing going further in places like Sri Lanka, for instance, most males are tuskless now. Right? The number of uh, tusk large males in, in most populations across Sri Lanka is just very, very minimal. Uh, and, yeah. and, you know, you probably have like uh, one in 20 or one in 25 males uh, being tusked, as opposed to mainland India, where most of our males are tuskers and, and the number of mak uh, maknas or the tuskless males have been far more uh, uh, less uh, compared to the other populations. But of course, in, in the northeastern parts of India where poaching pressure has still been prevalent, uh, we are seeing a slow switch towards, I mean, so, some of these places like Kaziranga and other you know, landscapes, you do see an increase in the number of uh, uh, tuskless males uh, as, as far as I understand. But uh, what's been the overall trend of uh, the African elephant population across the country? I mean, you, you're also on the African elephant specialist group of the IUC, and, and, and this is something that periodically you keep updating as well. And, and what's been the population trend been like, at least, let's say, the last 25 years in Africa? This, we keep getting these reports of the population steadily declining across the continent. But what has generally been the trend like? I think in the 90s and early 2000s, the African elephant was increasing. And then the in different parts of, of the continent, poaching sort of mid 2000s started up. And we saw, uh, say, Northern Africa, we saw some pretty major declines in population. Central Africa, we saw pretty consistent declines all the way through for the last 25 years. Um, and, and in Southern Africa, we saw consistent growth in, in some of the places. And then when the poaching came in, we saw pretty major declines, uh, particularly in Tanzania. And Kenya had some declines. Uh, 
several other countries had declines and in, in, in several countries remained stable through that. So the overall, the trend has been declining, uh, but it's, it's not, uh, people often ask this, they're like, oh, you know, given the trend is this, the species will be extinct in whatever X number of years. And, and that trend is um, highly heterogeneous across the continent. So yeah, we're going to likely lose certain populations, we'll, go, we'll, we'll be exterminated, but other populations are doing very well um, and are highly stable, and there's really no indication that um, they will, you know, be lost. So um, it's just that variation. There's, there's just the Africa is going to go through is going through a massive demographic transition. It's going to have most of the human population growth in the next uh, 50 years will occur on the continent. There's going to be expansion of where agricultural happens. There's going to be more deg degradation of of wildlands. Um, and that's going to result in greater loss of uh, biodiversity and, and wildlife and elephants in certain places. And, and hopefully with that, there'll be an economic transition as well, and there'll be better protection for places where elephants are viable for longer term. And so, um, you know, it's this, it's sort of this game of attrition that I think most places have, most continents have gone through. And I think we're getting to, to sort of watch the um hot you know the hot period for africa as it as it goes yes. through this transition so um it's going to be a tough it's going to be a tough uh few decades i think for the species but i'm i'm optimistic that they're going to be okay i think that that optimism is what keeps all of us going because uh, i think it, it's pretty similar for the asian elephants where it has been a fairly tough few decades and and going forward it isn't going to be any different i'm guessing but I, like like you rightly like said, you know there is still some light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, uh, as we speak about that, so uh, more or less at, at a broader scale, do you think the pressures for the forest elephant species and the savanna elephant species are are the same, and or or one species getting targeted for something and then the other getting targeted for something else? Uh, it, has there been any any sort of broad uh, changes in, in in trends of those? Yeah, I mean the forest system has had is you know had some of the most insecure, uh, I guess dysfunctional governing countries uh, on the planet, and that's had a huge impact on everything. You know, it's, it causes the death of of elephants, all you know apes, pri you know all biodiversity as well as all the humans too. It's it's been mm -hmm. very rough. Um, so that you know that's been a problem there uh from meat to ivory to you know whatever item someone wants to buy it's pretty uh sellable and so that's been huge impact on biodiversity in those places um interestingly the you know the as the populations in some of those forest countries are increasing we're seeing greater and greater issues with human elephant conflict so that and that's the, the major issue right now that we're that's pretty critical for the savanna elephant is is conflict. The Asian elephant's been conflict for a long time, yes. um, and I think we're all sort of, uh, yeah, ho you know, honing in on that being the biggest issue for the long term persistence. Is how do we how do we keep elephant human relationships as good as we can keep them um, on the agricultural boundary, and and that's a really right. it's going to be really challenging. Uh, in the forest, and that's that's um, more new, or it wasn't as big a focus until more recent. Um, and you know, as the as the as the forest elephant dec was declining pretty rapidly over the last whatever several decades, and so as you're declining that quickly, you don't tend to see the conflict, or maybe conflict becomes less because the elephants are so reclusive. And but as you get better protection in a place. Um, the elephants relax a bit, and when they're not feeling, you know, super persecuted, they they go and eat the best food around, and, and that tends to be whatever rice patty or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, and so that's yeah, so that's you know that's where we are everywhere in the continent. And so the, the forest elephants facing the, the most challenges of probably um, you know any you know the forest populations are the most threatened in Africa. Um, mm -hmm. But the the 
that we're converging on this key issue is, is how do we mitigate conflict? So, uh, and that being the biggest challenge for the Asian elephants, uh, and, and you know, most of our participants being fairly familiar with uh, human elephant conflict in Asia. Uh, and I think uh, coming back to the larger theme of the, the discussion today, understanding the Behavior has a huge role to play in, in, in conflict mitigation, and, and, and we've seen how a lot of the studies have really helped us understand the situation uh, better and, and, and perhaps suggest more pragmatic management strategies. So, uh, how do you, you know, and, and, and very often what happens is when you take conflict mitigation as a priority and, and discuss that with policymakers, there's very little time left, which perhaps may not be enough time to you know, do behavioral research, understand the system, and then suggest suitable management strategies. So how do you then bridge the gap here between, say, behavior and conservation? Yeah, the interesting thing for me about human wildlife or human elephant conflict is that it's really an individual behavior. It's really about the individual elephant's decisions. Um, and it's really about moderating their behavior. And so um, the key thing we're trying to do is we're trying to change elephant behavior. It's difficult. Like elephants are evolved to be the biggest, strongest thing on the landscape for a lot, you know, since their existence, really. So they've dominated, and there's there's really not been anything that's that's um, been able to affect them until we came up with sort of uh, weapons, modern tools, and um, and so they they tend to think whatever is good. They they you know, is theirs. And it's not unlike, for me, the other species that's kind of like that is the grizzly bear in North America. It's, it knows it's the biggest, baddest thing on the landscape. And so those animals are really hard to dissuade from getting what they want because, you know, I think they're hardwired to take what they want. But the, you know, conflict is a fundamentally a behavior. It's a, it's a behavioral choice the animal makes, um, how they access, access, those resources is, is through behavioral. We're, we're doing a bunch of stuff on the movement behavior of elephants as they crop raid. Um, and we can, you tend to see characteristic patterns of how they move prior to crop raiding. So they're making this decision. They go in They're you know, they're basically going into a high risk landscape. And so it's sort of evasive movements uh, where they try not to be detected and get that resource. And, um, and you can identify it, you know, by if you can collect data on their movement and so their movement behavior. And so, be, you know, and then the other part of this is if we can figure out things that are, you know, that dissuade elephants from going someplace or that they really don't like um, to such a great extent uh, that they avoid it. So say we looked at foraging, you know, what species do elephants never eat and don't like? So they don't really like tea. Right, tea is not, they're not crop rating tea. Um, and they don't like chili. So, you know, you grow chili, you grow tea, you grow certain crops, you're on the edge of elephant range, they're not gonna eat it. And so that foraging behavior can tell us a lot about some of the things we might be able to do to, to create a landscape that's less conflict prone. Um, and then the other side of this is, you know, what, what's the elephant decision process is there a way we can influence the decision process so that they don't get into trouble with people? Um, I think that's a, a tough question that, that a lot of us are asking. And um, and so that's something I'm looking forward to seeing breakthroughs in, in the future. I guess we can only just, you know, hope that we will have, you know, we sort of will have uh, some uh, uh, breakthrough in, in conflict management like, and going forward. Just, just going back to you know the the radio telemetry part that you briefly spoke about when you introduced about your work. I mean, they they, they range far and wide, especially in large contiguous landscapes. And unfortunately, this is uh, this is a, a luxury that they have not had to you know put collars on elephants, track them closely, and understand their movement patterns. But in landscapes where visibility has not been a constraint, we have used direct sightings. Uh, we have also used camera traps to sort of uh, cross verify and, and you know closely track at least a few known individuals and and map their overall ranging patterns. Uh, and uh, but but you know in in disturbed areas, for instance, we've even had linear movements or elephants like the when 
Uh, I know of my colleagues who have collared elephants in highly disturbed areas that have shown only linear movements, no circular movements at all, just kept moving, 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 and and then finally making a small, you know, uh, detour uh, and coming back and uh, eventually moving an area of over 5,000 square kilometer, which is extremely uh, abnormal for the Asian elephants, considering their ranges usually being between 200, 300 square kilometer. Now. With your, you know, over 20, 25 years of movement ecology research, can you just tell us, and, and this is all in the light of, uh, you know, changing environments, uh, large scale land use changes, etc. So can you in, tell us how the movement ecology research has informed us about the changing ecologies and the elephants in response to the same? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the movement work for us has been really the key to understand a lot of the, a lot of elephant behavior, population processes, um, you know, the key interactions with humans, human infrastructure. Um, it's the most informative behavior uh, because, you know, we, we can follow an animal long term when it's even when it's accessible and observable. And a lot of the time it's not, uh, you know, nighttime activity versus daytime activity. There's major shifts. Um, and so the movement has been, you know, just uh, really the most powerful insight for us on, on what's going on. And, and it's also really changed our perspective on the way elephants, uh, what, I guess, what areas are available to elephants. So elephants are using places that we sort of assume they would not, uh, you know, we're, we're no longer viable for them. And they just use it in a really, uh, complicated strategic way. And so we just wouldn't have really understood that. You get reports sometimes of, of uh, you know, whatever, a sighting or there's footprints or dung here or whatever. Like, oh, an elephant moved through there. Um, but it, it's, it's areas that we thought the species was extirpated. Um, and, you know, in, in many ways, you know, for example, Somalia, the elephants were extirpated from that country in the 70s. They were all, all shot out. And then we put some collars on in the on a coastal population, and we started having these elephants were going in and using parts of Somalia. We didn't even know elephants existed in Somalia, and um, so it's it's really ex expanded our understanding of how uh, the animals, um, you know, how elephants can use land, um, what areas are important to them, what areas they don't like, um, and and it's also been really key to understand some of the demography going on. So with, with following the elephants, you can actually watch them when they get, when they've been shot or they've been killed. Uh, you know, these, believe it or not, elephant carcasses aren't that hard to hide. Um, and so the sample of collars has given us huge insights into what's, what's causing their, their yeah. mortality, which for the most part, you know, in our system is well over half tends to be human caused. Um, but so that that information, when it's I guess when it's illegal, whatever the activity was that caused their death is illegal, they you know you tend to not know. And the only way we can tell is we only find that information out is is through collar, and it gives you a, a better insight. It's, you know, it gives you a really robust sample to understand what's actually happening to them and in, um, in their life. So we've. You know, we, we also found that this there's enormous amount of social aspects to space use in elephants. So they are structuring their space use. You know, humans obviously are a dominant force, but they're also um, strongly influencing each other. And so looking at interactions between elephants spatially with, with tracking data has been really eye-opening about how their societies work and, and what structures their societies and how their relationships work. And, um, what drives coordination, you know, the fission fusion process, the coming together of elephants and the, and the breaking apart of elephants and, and those types of questions also. So it's given us a lot of behavioral insight to not only spatial aspects of elephant populations, but social aspects um, and demographic aspects. And then it's probably the key for us, it's been the key data source for motivating governments to action. So showing the elephants moving through an area are actually using a place, um, it, it tends to, it's, it's fascinating for people. So all sorts of people from completely illiterate, you know, bush people 
uh, who who don't never been to school. They understand maps. They can what they they can see. They understand how things work. They are. It's a great way to connect with different people about what elephants are doing. Just being able to see them, what they're up to spatially, has been really powerful for us. Yeah, I th that, thanks. I think that, that yeah, that, that makes sense because, uh, and, and this is something that, like I mentioned earlier, you know, we try to grapple with because very often logistically it's been challenging for us to get the, these uh, collaring permits and, and put collars on elephants and track them. But, but the landscapes where I work in, 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 you know, predominantly being tea plantations where visibility has never been an issue, uh, putting tracking teams out there all through the day has really helped at least to try and understand the day ranging patterns of some of these elephants. Uh, so I'm not going to prolong this any further. Just that we have a bunch of questions that have come from our, our uh, listeners, and and I'm going to just ask a couple of them, uh, and then you know we can probably just move on to closing notes. One is uh, a follow up of the question that we discussed earlier. Uh, which is that uh, what influence do you think the removal of older individuals have on social transformation of knowledge and thus on elephant behavior uh, in the light of predator avoidance, migration, human elephant conflict, etc.? Yeah, I mean, it's substantial, right? The, the matriarchs are repositories of knowledge, so they're holding enormous ecological information, um, social information. And it influences everything, and so their loss is a is a huge loss. Um, you know, for example, we we're in the middle of an extreme drought right now, and what we're seeing is some of these we've had these orphans. Some of them are have been orphaned ten years, so they're they're basically adults. You know, they're they've grown up and they're doing well. Um, and then we have this sort of extreme drought situation, and you find that. Um, there's certain plants that, that you know, as, as the vegetation gets really denuded. Um, there's certain plants that are poisonous, and we're, we've actually had a spate of mortalities due to these orphans. Not, I think they just don't know that these plants are bad, and so they eat them, and it gets sick, and it kills them, um, versus, you know, the elephants that are in normal family structure just don't, they, they're not allowed to eat them, or they're taught not to eat them, or whatever it is, who knows exactly how it works, but they don't um, have that pressure. So. Um, yeah, that that knowledge loss is substantial and 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 really impactful for them. How to bring about a mind shift in policymakers to make them understand the importance of long term monitoring of elephants? And yeah, I think I mean that's a question that even I would have you know asked if I was just listening to you because uh, uh, this is something again we find extremely challenging because. Uh, very often, and, and this is something, you know, if you step into the shoes of a policymaker or a, uh, or a manager, you would probably, you know, uh, be on the same page as them. Uh, they, they are under a lot of pressure with, with regard to management and they need uh, steadfast, quick solutions to problems, uh, but often do not realize the importance of long-term monitoring of species like elephants that are long lived. Uh, how, how challenging or easy has it been communicating with policymakers there and convincing them about the importance of the same? Um, you know, working in Kenya has been, I guess, maybe a bit blessed because there's, there's pretty strong recognition of the importance um, of elephants in, in a number of ways. So um, there's been a, sort of a lot of support for the long-term uh, program there. Um, We've also, you know, always interact with politicians that are highly antagonistic to elephants. And so um, having the, the individual stories of, of elephants can be really powerful for communicating to in the policy realm or, um, or to politicians or the public. Um, and so that's what long term monitoring gives you is those individual stories. And, and as I mentioned, those so we what we have is we're really blessed with deep long term information on the elephants individually. And then on top of that, we put on the radio collars on these ones that we know. And that combination is, is gold dust. And so you can really tell the entire story. And, and so this, you know, the stories of these individuals um, can be really powerful and, and when you get a chance. And, and we've also found that we animate the GPS tracking data. So you actually get to sort of watch them, you know, live their life and show them using these areas and what they're doing. And that has been really powerful as well to, to express these stories. Um, so for example, like a key connectivity area that's under threat, 
Um, you have an elephant track moving through it that you animate and show it to people. Um, it really can open doors to trying to find a solution to protect that corridor. Yeah, I think that, but, but this is, I mean, with particular reference to moment data, I think uh, that has a lot of relevance when communicating to policymakers and managers, particularly in securing landscapes, securing corridors, etc. Uh, there's another question on uh, the methods or solutions to reduce human elephant conflicts. There's, there's also emphasis on biological methods or solutions in this question. Uh, but what do you think uh, has worked or has been working by and large? at least in containing the problem to a certain extent. And this is something we all know that the problem can never be brought down to a zero level. So what has what is something that has largely worked in the case, to, case of human elephant conflict with African elephants? And how has science informed that? Yeah, so, you know, there's a bunch of solutions out there. I think that the work on Chile has had moderate success, uh, the beehive fencing work has had moderate success in, in, in certain areas. Um, the bar different types of barriers tend to work. There's this smelly elephant concoction thing that we're messing with now that, that tends to dissuade elephants. Um, you know, a lot of olfactory cues seem to be uh, pretty important in this story. Um, but, you know, there's, there's always individuals that don't care and are willing to do whatever to get to those resources. So there's you know, we haven't have found something a hundred percent, except for maybe electric fencing, which is really expensive. Um, so we're, you know, we're just all experimenting with, you know, can we come up with low cost barriers Is digging a trench, um, good enough. It, you know, some of these things work well, if, if they, if, if you set up something and then there's resources that, you know, not too far away that don't have that barrier, then the elephants will go off and, you know, it can protect this one individual's farm, but then they go hit somebody else's farm. Um, so that's not really great, but, um, but you know, we're, yeah, we're all trying to come up with new ideas and, and it seems like a lot of what works is changing up what you're doing. And so if you do the same thing for too long, the elephants uh, figure a way around it. And so, you know, having sort of a more dynamic approach to this looks like pretty important and, and switching up your tactics, uh, trying to stay a step ahead of the elephant seems like pretty important. So uh, I think that, that, that's it. I don't think we have uh, any more questions here. So uh, I, I just, you know, I, I don't think I have enough words to thank you for this. You know, even within this limited time, you have comprehensively covered uh, what we wanted to discuss in this session. Uh, and, and this has just made the World Elephant Day uh, special, I'm sure, for the, the participants because uh, as as we celebrate the World Elephant Day, there's, you know, it, it is also time that we acknowledge the, the myriad of threats that the species faces. So, uh, for a, a session like this would only help them understand better uh, that you know there's a long way ahead for the species. Although there is still some light at the end of the tunnel for the species to reach the end of the tunnel, there is a long way ahead, and and it's only through uh, science-based management and science-based conservation that we can uh, further our uh, battles towards uh, conserving the, the large remnant populations of both the African and the Asian species. So thank you so much for uh, you know for taking your time and and you know uh, and, and spending time with us discussing these these various ideas uh, and, and on the, both on behalf of, of Center for Wildlife Studies and 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 my personal side I, I thank you for this wonderful uh, session. My pleasure. Thanks for inviting me and it was fun to, to discuss this with you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and thanks to all the participants for patiently, patiently listening to us. If you have any uh, further questions, feel free to write to us. If they have mentioned the email address at the end of the, uh, the beginning of the session, you can just write uh, to us on that and we would be happy to get back to you and, and clarify uh, any further questions that you have. So thank you so much. Thank you once again. Thank you, Josh. Thank you to all the participants. Great. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Have a good evening. Uh, and if you want to know more about CWS's work or if you would like to uh, know particular programs in detail or contribute to any of our programs, uh, you can log on to our webpage or write to outreach at cwsindia.org or you can just find this QR code on our, on our webpage and scan it. Uh, 